kids are dismissed to go out to junior church at this time. Looks like Debbie's taking them out today. Who, before I get started with the sermon, who's excited for the real greatest day in sports today? I'll give you a hint. I'm wearing it right now. Not, it wasn't last Sunday, it's this Sunday, the Daytona 500 today at about 2.30. Very excited for that. I hope, I see there's a lot of excitement in this room about it, but um, personally, that's where I'm feeling today. But. No, it's really excited for this uh, third week in our study of God that we have this morning. And in this third week of the study of God that we're calling God is, we look at one of the harder things to understand about God, at least on the surface, is God's jealousy. And what we remind ourselves today is with God and for his followers, imposters will not be accepted or tolerated. We all experience imposters in this lifetime. We are all faced every day, every moment, in fact, of this day, of this life, with imposters. Everyone knows, for example, this product here. Everyone knows this product at the first glance, right? Coca-Cola. We talked about last Easter, if you were with us, about the notoriety of this logo and this product. But with this product also comes many imposters, including cola from, like Weiss, for example. Cola that is not Coca-Cola, but it's meant to be a cheap knockoff of Coca-Cola. No offense to, to Weiss there. Another example of this, everybody, I think, knows this ketchup, right, and knows this product, Heinz, and it's wonderful, 57 varieties of tomatoes, I guess, that go in. I don't really know what the varieties are, but it's wonderful, and this is true and real ketchup. But then, of course, there's always the knockoff brand of ketchup as well. There's Hunt's and this store brand ketchup. Again, no offense to Weiss, but it's not real ketchup if it's not Heinz, in my opinion. <laughs> Then, of course, there's the, uh, I think, another product that we all know and love, Oreos, right? I particularly love Oreos in its double-stuffed form. They even have mega stuff now, if you see at the store as well. But there's always imposters of every great thing, and there's imposters like, I've never even heard of this until I saw it at the store, but there's craven flavor, chocolate double-stuffed cookies, chocolate sandwich cookies with vanilla cream. Wonder where they got that idea from. There are imposters. There's the real thing, and then there are imposters in our world. One final example, there's, for example, there's one real car company that's out there in this life. There's Chevrolet, and then there's imposters like Ford that are out there. Some people accept this as a real car brand. We have to be on the watch that there are imposters in our lives and in our world. But what we remind ourselves today as we study the jealousy of God is that God will not accept imposters. And so God's people should not accept imposters either. We say all that to say that there are many imposters in this lifetime, that we are faced with every day and everywhere that we turn. We are faced with different things, both good and, and bad things, that pull at the strings of our hearts, of our minds, and of our souls, that pull at those things for our allegiance. And today in our study of God, as we come to this hard to grapple with, hard to understand description and attribute of God, which is his jealousy, we remind ourselves that God will not accept these lesser things for his people. That God will not accept store brand, man-made, and thus, again, lesser things that getting the top billing in our lives. To use a biblical terminology, God will not accept idols, right? We see this here in this small aerial view of the Ten Commandments that we will be looking at today as we look at Exodus chapter 20 that Mike just read for us again. Just reflect deeply and you can keep that open this morning. We'll be there all morning. Again, there God says to us, I am the Lord your God. I'm the God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You should not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above, on the earth beneath, or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing love to the thousands generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. God here begins his declaration of the Ten Commandments that we are to base our lives upon with his statement of authority for doing so. He says, I 
am. Of course, recalling back to the burning bush moment when God first calls out to Moses and sets this whole thing in motion. He says, I am the Lord your God. And then he says how he has proven this. He says, I've proven this by releasing you from slavery and bondage in Egypt. And then God wastes no time. He gets right to the point and says, because of this, because I am the Lord your God who has done this and has proven this to you, you shall have no other lowercase g gods before me. The very first command that we are given as God's followers seems obvious on paper, but it's obviously hard to live out in life. The reality of if the Lord your God is our God, if he has proven himself already to be our God, then we should have no other gods before him. Then we should have no other lowercase g gods before us. That's the first command. And then the second is very much like it. When God demands of us not to make for ourselves images in any form, in heaven above or in the earth beneath or in the waters below, we shall not bow down to them because the Lord our God, he is a jealous God. He punishes the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation, but he blesses those that love him to the thousandth generation. Now, two things I believe that we need to address before we actually dive into the jealousy of God. The first thing is, you might be thinking to yourself, well, I thought just two weeks ago we kicked off our study of God by learning that, that God is one, that God is one God in three persons. If you're like me, you may read these words and think, well, why would God say here that we should have no God's before him? Are there actually other gods to have before them? Well, what we learn here is that we can make anything into a god. That we can literally place anything, literally anything before God. We can place good things, we can place bad things before God. We can place living things and inanimate things before God. We can even place religious things before God. We can set anything on the throne of our lives, anything in the heaven above and in this, the earth below before God. We can give them the place of, of God in our lives. We can give anything that position in our lives, but only God has the authority to actually be there. And thus, only God has actually earned the right to be there. Understanding the jealousy of God and really the Ten Commandments as a whole comes down to remembering how they begin and what its beginning means. It says again, I am the Lord, your God, your personal God. This is who God is. That is who he pro has proven himself to be. He has proven himself to be the one and only God. He has done this by bringing us out of the land of slavery. Of course, in this moment, he exemplifies it by bringing his people out of the slavery that they faced in Egypt. But we, of course, knowing this side of the cross, that he is the God that has brought us out of the ultimate slavery. He's the God that has brought us out of the slavery of sin and evil that we are all placed under as those born of Adam. We can make anything into gods in our lives. We can make Dagon, we can make Asherah, we can make Baal into our, the gods of our lives. In our day, we can make money, sex, power, prestige, politics, race, nationality, even good things like family and religion. We can make all these things God in our lives. But the reality is, and we can kick and scream against this as much as we want, but the reality is only one has the authority, only one has earned the right to be the real G, God, in our lives. Only one thus has the staying power to stay as the God of our lives. There are many gods, but only one God. Second, what in the world does it mean that God punishes the sins of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate him but shows love to the thousandth generation of those who love him. So the question here is, is our relationship with God left up and based in some way, in any way, on our parents, either their sins or either their obedience before God? Again, to understand this, we have to understand what God is actually establishing in the Ten Commandments. Think about the history of the covenant that God is establishing here. We see this played out throughout the Old Testament. If one generation of Israel sinned, were the consequences of those sins only lived out and played out in that generation? No, of course. For example, David's sin that set in motion this gradual descent for Israel because of the uh, descent from the blessing and the wonderful high time that David's obedience set him forth, of course, David's sin had consequences. The Bible says that very clearly, that that sin was going to unravel Israel until they eventually fell into exile. 
Yet at the very same time, David's sin set in motion for Israel uh, this downfall. Remember, throughout Israel's history, God continues to be faithful to his covenant. He continues to be faithful to the very covenant that he makes with David, that one day he will set as one of his sons on the throne that will reign forever and ever. Our sin, it does always come with consequences, right? Consequences that not only affect us, that not only affect those living within our lifetime, but consequences that affect even the lifetimes and generations of those to come. But what God is saying to us is, I will ultimately take the consequences upon myself. Remember what Joshua says in just one generation from this moment in Moses' life in Joshua chapter 24, 19, when Israel is again after their sin and falling away from God, renewing this very covenant. Joshua says to the people, even after they say they can serve the Lord, he says, you will not be able to serve the Lord. We are ultimately not able to serve the Lord. We are ultimately not able to fulfill the jealous love of our God. The jealousy, the zeal of the love of our God that he has for each and every one of us. But the covenant that God makes with us, with each and every one of us, what makes God's love so amazing is he knows that full well. He knows that we will never be able to live up to our end of the covenant, no, our end of the contract, to put it in, in more modern terms. Yet he still makes the, that covenant, knowing that one day he's going to have to be the one to fulfill both ends of the covenant, both sides of the contract. Knowing that one day he's going to have to give himself, that one day he's going to have to give his son as a ransom to fulfill the contract, to fulfill the covenant unfaithfulness of his people. Remember back, one of my favorite moments in Scripture is Genesis chapter 22, where the covenant actually begins. That most wonderful promise that God gives to Abraham and to all of his sons and daughters. That promise that on the mountain of the Lord, the Lord will provide. Not Abraham's son Isaac to die for the sins of the world. God not only provides in that moment the ram in the thicket, but ultimately, on that very mountain, that God is going to provide his own son. He's going to provide his own son, not as a temporary sacrifice for the sins of one man, but as a permanent and all-sufficient sacrifice for the sins of all humankind. Sin always comes with consequences, but the love of God promises to ultimately cover over those consequences. Now, let's deal with this troubling to our hearts description and attribute of God. God is a jealous God. Now, if you're reading that again on the surface, if you read that like me, you're thinking, well, I thought jealousy was a bad thing. Isn't in our world and in our lives jealousy a sinful thing? Well, the answer to that question is yes. Jealousy, the jealousy that is found in this world and that is most often seen in our lives is evil and sinful. But it's not that type of jealousy that both God describes and that defines our God. Our jealousy, worldly jealousy, the jealousy that we know of and, and most often think of can be boiled down to, to one word. It can be boiled down to the word envy, right? The jealousy that the world knows of and that we often think of when we read how God is described as a jealous God, it sets off alarms bells because that type of jealousy is based in envy and in selfishness, right? It's based in pride and self-seeking. A great example of this type of jealousy is found in the Bible, and it's, still, it's found in the type of jealousy that Saul has towards David. Remember what we read in 1 Samuel chapter 18. Saul is king, but David is on the rise to the top. David comes back from this moment from killing the Philistine Goliath, giant Goliath, and he's greeted with a parade from the people. He's greeted with a party from the people. The people of Israel are lining the streets and they are shouting, Saul has killed his thousands, but David, he's slain his tens of thousands. And King Saul hears that and he is jealous for the allegiance of his people. He's envious of the allegiance of this people that is now turning to David. He is fearful that he will lose his position of power and envious that David is going to be the one that is going to take it away. And of course, we know that, that Saul lived out that jealousy of David in a way that was anything but good and certainly not self-sacrificing for David. 
But while the jealousy of this world is defined by envy and selfish ambition, the jealousy of God is defined by self-sacrifice. When we are jealous, we want what is best for ourselves, right? We want what is best for me, myself, and I. But when God is jealous, and because God is jealous, he wants what is best for everyone else. He wants what is best for you and I. The Apostle Paul speaks about this godly and divine jealousy in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Paul speaks of loving the church in a way with a godly jealousy that desires what is best for the individuals of the church. The word in the original language that is translated jealousy in the Hebrew can also be rightly translated as zeal or loving zealously. When we think about it, that, that's not hard to understand. Each of us has loved someone in this type of way, especially those that, that are married or have children. Let me ask you, in your marriage or for your children, do you not want what is best for your spouse or for your child? In your great love for them, do you not desire to, for them to be with you because you believe that you are the best thing for them, because you will sacrifice anything for them? Do you not believe that within your love, in your self-sacrificing love, in your jealous and zealous love, are you not going to do anything to see them succeed and, and, and be the best, uh, the best, experience the best life now? No marriage works well unless both partners are zealous for the best of the other partner. It's only, in fact, when one partner or both partners starts to put their own interest over the other's interest that a marriage begins to to unravel and to fail. And it is that same type of love and it's the same reality that's lived out with the love of God. God jealously loves us. God zealously loves each and every one of us. God, out of that zealous love, wants what is best for us. God desires what is best for us in such a zealous intensity that he sacrificed himself through his son to be with us to give us the best that we can experience in both this lifetime and ultimately in the next lifetime. God loves us intimately, he loves us personally, and he loves us intensely. And out of that love, he wants what is best for us. And the reality of God and his love, that the jealousy of his love revealed to us is that God desires the best for his people and that he knows he is best for his people. God desires the best for us, and he knows that the best for us is God. That's the thing that sin and ego and pride distort in our, that is foundational to our relationship with God and our following of his ways. This is what is distorted in our lives, and it's so detrimental to our following God's commands, like we see revealed in the Ten Commandments. God truly wants what is best for us. God knows in his sovereignty that he is what is best for us. God is our good God. Everything that he is, everything that he does, everything that he desires of us is for our good, and it is the true best way for our life to go. So when we come to passages like the Ten Commandments, we should read them not as dictations of an oppressive dictator, but instead we should read them as invitation away, invitations away from imposters invitations away from imposters that say they are what is best for us. Instead, invitations to follow God's commands, to follow God's ways, to submit to God's laws and that are invitations away from imposters, an invitation towards what is truly best for us. I've said this before, but but I don't know about you, I, I want to live in a world where the zealous, rich, never-ceasing love of God is seen to the thousandth generation. Right? I want to see the commands of God that are given to us lived out. I want to live in a world where every sixth day we are given the opportunity, the gift of Sabbath and rest. To rest from our labors. I want to live in a world where there is no murder. I want to live in a world where we don't have to lock our doors at night because no one is, is threatening to steal our things. A world where our mothers and fathers are honored. Think about that. With these things, that, these are things that even the hardened atheist and the devout Christian can agree upon, right? We want to live in a world where these things are reality. 
Yet because of the distortion of sin in our lives, because of the distortion of the enemy in our world, we have somehow turned these commands that are commanded for our good into oppressive commands meant only for our torment. This is not so. God is good. Our God is good. God is working all things, even the hardest things of this life in this world, for our good. God truly wants what is best for us, and in his sovereignty, he knows what is best for us is himself. That's the jealous love of God in a sentence. Our God wants what is best for us, and he knows what is best for us is himself. It's his, it's his ways. It's his work revealed to us. It's his work at work within us. Those are not the thoughts of a, of a selfish. These commands and the others we see in Scripture, they're not the, the thoughts or the commands of a selfish and self-seeking God, but it is the reality of life. It is witness in his commands and it is witness in his work. God is what is best for us. This is fully revealed to us through the work of his Son, Jesus Christ. God jealously and zealously wants what is best for us. It is defined by his self-sacrifice. Our jealousy, again, wants what is best for me, myself, and I, for ourselves. And it is defined and it is rooted in envy and selfish pride. But God's love and his sacrifice, his jealous love, is rooted in what is best for you and I. For, it's best for everyone else. So that is how we can define God's jealous love. That's the difference between God's jealous love and the jealous uh, type of love that exists in our world. But what does that type of love of God mean for our lives? I believe it means three things for us this morning. The first, the jealousy of God demands our exclusive devotion to God. We've already begun to unpack this this morning. It is what Jesus himself speaks of in Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 through 14, when he says to us, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many will enter through that gate. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few will find us. Listen, God desires what is best for us. The part of God's love we have no problem with. We have no, part, we have no problem with that part of God's love. And I would say that that is true of both the follower of Christ and, again, the hardened atheist alike. In, pre in, in uh, proper preparation for this sermon, I listened to a message about the jealousy of God from pastor and author Tim Keller. And in that message that I listened to, Keller quotes so a sociologist who has studied the American perception and expectation of God. And he, the sociologist, defined the American perception and, and expectation of God in this way. He defined it as moralistic, therapeutic deity. Moralistic, therapeutic deity. Fun to, and kind of hard to say, but it's actually fairly easy to define. First, deity. Deism, meaning that the Americans do believe that there is a higher power. That we ultimately and mostly believe that there is a deity and power above us. And then the moralistic therapeutic in that we as Americans believe that if we have good morals, that if we live, quote, good lives, that, that then that higher power that is ab uh, above us should treat us therapeutically should treat us like a therapist and just give us whatever it is that we want. That that moralist, that that God, because of our good morals, should just give us what we desire. That should respond to us in our, uh, our good life by giving us whatever it is that we desire. By giving us the good life and the best life, but the good life and the best life, again, as we define it as we define truth, as we define best, as we define what in fact is good. Now I asked you this morning, did this sociologist not perfectly define the American perception of God in defining it as a moralistic therapeutic deism? We want what is best for us, right? Each and every one of us can agree upon that. God wants what is best for us. We are on the same page as God there. But where the divide comes is here. We want to be the ones who define what is best for us. We want to be the ones who define what is good for us. 
We want to be the ones who define what is truly good for us. We, in our selfish and worldly jealousy, want to keep our grips firmly on deciding what is best for our lives. While God, in his zealous and jealous love for us, knows what is best for us, and so he is very, very, very clear that he is what is best for us, and thus he is the one that's going to determine what is best for us. God says to us here, Jesus says to us, the Holy Spirit is constantly saying to us that the road that leads to destruction, it is a broad road. He says many will find that road and they will also then find destruction. But that this, and this road starts with things in our minds, thoughts in our, in our minds or, or words of our mouths that go like this I, or something like this, like, I know what is, is best. I know better than God. I, I want this, and I don't care what God says. I'm going to do this. I'm going to get this. I'm going to do this, and I don't care if God's design is better for me. I'm going to get what I want now, right? Broad is that gate, and that gate always, always, always ultimately leads to destruction. But small and narrow is the road that leads to life, Jesus says, and only a few will find it. Those that have found it have found that when we follow God, when we lay down our own version of good for the good of others, when we follow the example of Jesus and live obedient to our Father in heaven, we not only receive what is best for ourselves, but we reveal what is best for the world. We reveal what is truly best for others. That is why God is so insistent in demanding our exclusive devotion to himself and to himself alone. The jealousy of God reminds us of this. In addition to this, the jealousy of God dispatches judgment on those who defy God. Now, Exodus 20 is, is the beginning of the story, if you will. It's the beginning of this particular covenant given through Moses to God's people, and of course, based upon his jealous and zealous self-sacrificing love for us. But just chap 14 chapters over in Exodus, we begin to get the rest of the story. Of course, even when we experience the revealed love of God, as we see here in Exodus 20 through the Ten Commandments, it does not take us long as people to go our own way, right? We know the story. We, we know Moses ascends to Mount Sinai to speak to the Lord, but he does not come back from his conversation with God in the timing and in the way that the people desired or expected. And so in the beginning of Exodus chapter 32, we read, When the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and they said to Aaron, Come, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. This is exactly what God is warning us about in saying that we shall have no other gods before him. That's why it's the first thing that he warns us against. Why? Because what is the first thing that Israel did when God did not operate and function in the timing that, God, that Israel expected him to? When God did not operate as the moralistic, therapeutic uh, conception of God that they had. What did they do? They created other gods who would operate the way that they could control. They took all that they had and they went down that, that, that broad road that leads to death and destruction. And what is it that they found down that road? They found death and destruction. Under the leadership of Aaron, Israel takes the gold that they had and they form it into a golden calf and they worship that golden calf. God, of course, sees this and he's ready to destroy the people as we deserve, as they deserve. But Moses intercedes on the mountain of the Lord, which, of course, is a picture of what is to come and what is taking place in this day through Jesus as he intercedes before God on the mountain of the Lord. But because of our sin, Moses intercedes and God relents from his anger and the calamity that he had threatened. But still, even with this relenting of God from the calamity that he threatened, there are still, sacrifice, still consequences for the sin of the people. Levites, for one, go through the camp and, of the Israelites and they slay about 3,000 Israelites on this day. God then sends a plague that would slay more Israelites on this day. Worst of all, God in this moment threatens to be done with Israel. 
he threatens to blot them out and just start over with Moses. But Moses intercedes and the covenant of God's jealous love is renewed again. And God says again in the renewal of this covenant in verse 14 of chapter 34, he says to the people very plainly and clearly, do not worship any other gods. For the Lord whose name is jealous is a zealous or is a jealous God. The jealous love of God is often in many ways rejected by us in our lives. And if we continually throughout our lives only reject God and his love, that, lo that rejection of his love then dispatches judgment on those who defy it, right? We are each, each and every one of us, every person who walks this land, we are given the individual personal opportunity throughout our lives to either accept this truth of God's love or reject the truth of God's love to fight against or surrender to the reality that God is a jealous love for us and he loves us in a way that always desires what is best for us. And God, because of his jealous love, because he desires what is best for us, he wants us to follow his ways. He knows that his ways are truly the best ways, that his ways are truly what is good for us. And those who defy this dispatch judgment on themselves. Those who reject God and his good love can only give God one verdict to render, right? You didn't want his love, so God has to expel you eventually from his love. God's, the rejection of God's love dispenses judgment on those who defy God. But don't forget that the jealousy of God, that the jealous love of God also is able to deliver his people. We know how things go for Israel, even from the place of their first rebellion in Exodus 34. That was their first rebellion and sin against God, but unfortunately it was far from their last rebellion and sin against God. We know throughout the era this, that are to come, the era of God given Israel the, the best land that the world has ever known, but even there and amidst that land that they would continue to sin and rebel against him. We know throughout the era of the kings, when God gave them the best earthly king that the world has ever known in David, that, that even then, and even that king himself, would rebel and sin against God. We know eventually that even as God would send his very own perfect son to this world, we know how we responded, right? We ended up rebelling and sinning against that God by crucifying him on a cross. We know that in the 2,000 years that have since passed, since that sin and rebellion, we know that the best song that we sing as a people is our sin and rebellion against God. And the prophet Joel speaks of the day when God will bring what we just spoke about to fruition. A day when God will dispense judgment on those that defy him. In Joel's vision, he sees this through a plague of locusts that ascends on the land and destroys the land and thus destroys the sustenance of the people of the land. Yet Joel also in chapter 2 predicts, he says, if we repent, if we return from our sins, if we turn from our rebellion against God, then maybe, just maybe, God will relent and turn from his fierce anger. And then in Joel chapter 2 verse 18, we get God's answers to the people's repentance, his answer to our repentance as well. There the, there the Lord says, Then the Lord was jealous for his land, and he took pity on his people. The Lord was jealous for his land, and he took pity on his people. In Joel's vision, the people turn from their sin, and because God is a jealous God, because God's love is jealous, he takes pity on his land, but ultimately on his people, and he restores them to life again. He raises them to life again. Of course, we know that that, res that restoration does not ultimately come through the, the restoration of farmland, as Joel's vision proclaims. Rather, it comes through the restoration of our souls that only comes about through Jesus Christ. That comes about and only through God sending his Son into the world in our flesh, into our lives, fully God, yet fully man, living the 100% free from sin life, completely obedient to God and his jealous love. 
so that he could only then lay down willingly his perfect life in place of our sinful life, so that he could pay the price in full for all of the consequences of our sins. Ultimately, that consequence, ultimate consequence of our sin, which is death. We most often think of God's jealousy in a way that we think of the world's jealousy, right? We think of God's jealousy as, as bad things. That God in his ways, in his commands, in his person, only want what is best for himself. But that could not be, is not further from the truth. That could not be further from the reality that God, is, that God has revealed to us through his Son in Jesus Christ. The reality that God loves you. The reality that God zealously and jealously loves you. The reality that God loves you to an intensity that he desires only what is best for you. The reality that we have to surrender to is that he is what is best for us. That he knows truly what is best for us. I want to end our discussion of God's jealousy with just a few more thoughts on this perception of God that has broadly swept humankind, not just Americans. That perception of God of of a moralistic, therapeutic, therapeutic deity. Let me challenge you this morning to not think of, about how the world perceives God, but, but how do you perceive God? C.S. Lewis talks about this false, false perception that sin creates in our mind of God in his book, The Problem of Pain. The reality is God is our heavenly Father. God is our heavenly sustainer. He is our Heavenly Father, and the Ten Commandments in all of Scripture reminds us that He is your God. That He is our God that has delivered us out of the slavery of sin. The reality, that reality is not up for debate. When God says, I am, He is, right? When God says, I am the Lord, your God, He is the Lord, your God. We can live our lives kicking and screaming about this, but that does not change who God is is. He is God and the Lord. He is also your God and Lord. He reveals that to us here. I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God. I love you in this way, the way that we have described this morning. He loves us in a way that is best and always best for us. God is our Father who loves us to our ultimate best end. But as Lewis puts it, what we want in heaven, what we want in God is not a father in heaven who both knows and gives us what is best, who fervently desires what is truly best for us. Rather, what we want is a, is a grandfather in heaven. Now, to the grandfathers that are among us, don't take any offense to this, but grandfathers are not always known for ultimately giving to their grandchild what is ultimately and eternally best for them, right? They don't always do the ultimate and eternal best for their kids. Rather, what are grandfathers known for? Grandfathers are known for giving their grandkids whatever it is that they want, right? They give their grandkids all the sweet treats, all the whims of their hearts because they can turn them back to their uh, actual fathers. And that's ultimately what we want God to be in our sin. We want him to be our grandfather in heaven who just gives us all the sweets, all the treats, all the type of love that we desire to be loved by. He wa we want a grandfather in heaven that just gives us the whims of our hearts. But ultimately, that is not what is best for us, and so ultimately, that is not what God gives to us. That's not the type of love that God reveals to us. What is best for us is what God has for us. It's that firm foundation that we can build our lives upon no matter what it is that may come. That's the God that is revealed to us in the Ten Commandments and throughout the gamut of God's Word. That's the God that we can build our lives upon and know that what we are building upon is truly good. The God who in his zealous and jealous love for us desires what is best for us. So much so that he gives us what is best for us. He gives us himself. He gives us his Son. He gives us his Holy Spirit. Ultimately, he gives us his love. So the question that each of us needs to answer is, how do we perceive God? 
Praise God that when God is rightly perceived, we see a God of jealous love who wants, who gives, and who is what is best for us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, we thank you and praise you for these hard truths that reveal that you are something that is so set apart from this world that we have a hard time comprehending you, that we have a hard time understanding the rich, lavish love that you have freely poured out to us, Lord. But Lord, how we love to seek to understand it, Lord. And while we know that living this side of heaven, we will never fully understand the lavish love that you have poured out to us through your Son, Jesus Christ, Lord. Lord, we ask that today, in a fresh, new, and deeper way that you, through the power of your Holy Spirit and under the authority of your word, would help us to live into and understand and then reflect your rich love to the world that is around us, love, to know the firm foundation and a deeper sense in our personal lives that is the jealous love of our God, that we can build our lives upon your word and upon you, know that if we do so, while we will still face trials and hardships of plenty, we can know that through the trials and hardships, you are working everything for our ultimate good. And the good that you work our lives for is actually an eternally good, Lord. Lord, we pray that if we have not known this uh, zealous and jealous love of our lives in a in, 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 uh, personal sense before today, Lord, I pray that, that you would work through these individuals and call them into this personal saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, this life-altering, life-changing path that is the jealous love of God that has sent his son into the, your son into this world to die for our sins, to die in our place, as the payment for our sins, as the ransom from our slavery, and that you have confirmed the full receipt of this payment through raising him to life again, that all those who believe in their heart that Jesus Christ is Lord and that he was raised to life again by God will experience a new and eternal life through the forgiveness of sins and then will spend their eternity in heaven, Lord. Lord, I pray for this assurance for each and every one within the sound of my voice, Lord, and may we, as your people, be perfect and better witnesses of this as we go forward, Lord. For it's in your Son's name that we pray. Amen.